Stereopolis. I'm, I'm here from the, the Bristol Robotics Laboratory, which is a, a, a collaborative platform between the two universities in, uh, in Bristol, the University of Bristol and the University of the West of England in, in Bristol. And I'm going to talk about uh, the work we've been doing on microwave fuel cells for um, the last decade and also for the more recent uh, Bill and Gates Foundation funded uh, work which is to do with urine utilization, uh, which we call urine tricity. So I feel like I'm preaching to the converted when I, I go through these bullet points. Everyone knows the real problems of, of sanitation and according to the recent um, uh, uh, publications on the William and the Gates Foundation website, as a one and a half million children die as a result of waterborne diseases, and uh, two and a half billion people defecate um, unsafely or, or outside. Um, most of uh, the developed nations, and I'm using the UK as an example, uh, employ municipal, municipal infrastructures that uh, simply take the waste and pass it down the the drain, um, and, and most of the UK European toilets, they use 10 times as much water than the, the waste that they're flushing. So it's down to the wastewater treatment companies to deal with uh, the problem, and of course it's an expensive flocculation, coagulation uh, process. Uh, we all know here in San Juan commodity, um, and it has been considered as a uh, resource, we've seen that in the last uh, uh, two days of the conference, but uh, very recently we've shown that urine can also be used as a fuel for direct electricity production inside the microwave fuel cell. No pretreatment and no um, kind of catalysts or any other expensive materials used in the process. Um, although uh, Arun and, and, uh, showed a very good uh, description of the technology and Brad showed the pragmatic implementation of the microwave fuel cell. So, um, I still like to go through my next couple of slides to describe the technology. Um, so basically it is a technology that functions on microbial metabolism. The microbes are the biocatalysts. Organic fuel is directly converted to electricity and I'll go through that. So we can perceive microbial fuels as bio batteries. The only difference is that for as long as we provide the fuel they never run out if we get the hydraulics and the kinetics right. So some examples of the microwave fuels as we've been playing with, just to show you that they can come in different shapes and forms. <coughs> it's not important to name all of those um, systems there, but there are soft microwave fuel cells, spherical microwave fuel cells made out of chewing gum boxes, pipetic microwave fuel cells, and, and the analytical types on the top. <coughs> So um, I'll try and uh, animate the description of the microwave fuel cell, how it works, and um, how we get the electricity from the microbes onto the electrode as far as we understand. So I'm shamelessly showing the microbial cell as that red circle there. Um, <clears throat> and we know from textbook microbiology, the Krebs cycle, the uh, tricarboxylic cycle of microbial fuel cells, We've got the electron transport chain flowing from the most negative to the most positive. So once we've got fuel going into the system, we've got electrons flowing down the electron transport chain. In the case of soluble mediators found in the system, those are able to penetrate the lipid membrane of the microbial cell, intercept the electron transport chain, and diffuse outside, deposit the electron on the electrode through the electrophilic reaction between the anode and the cathode, the electron goes through the external circuit and it combines on the cathode side with a proton that flows through the membrane. And open to air cathode, electrons and protons react with oxygen and we get water as a byproduct on the cathode side. The second mechanism inside the microbial fuel cell are those microbes which directly colonize the, the electrode surface. Um, we've, we've seen before that we can have direct conductance from the microbes. This could be a, a, a continuous conductive protein chain or nanowires, there's two schools of, of thought on that. Um, but the, the important thing, as, as, again, as far as we're concerned, is that there is a, there's a flux of electrons. Once we colonize that electrode optimally, 
then we've got the microbes respiring through the electrodes. So they survive by taking the waste, metabolizing, and then respiring, giving their electrons to the, to the electrode. And in, uh, in, a, in a continuous flow system where we, we, keep, we maintain a certain HRT, uh, hydraulic retention time, we can accurately control the thickness of the mountain. So that it can be multi-layered, but not prohibitively accumulated and thick. So it stops the electron flow or the access to the fuel. And this is the work we've been doing over the years. So uh, I'm not sure how clearly you can see the, the graphs, but over the over the, the last few years, we've been looking into different types of uh, refined organic substrates and unrefined organic substrates that we can use for our microbial fuel cells. On the top left, you see uh, cellulose, acetate, chitin, pectin, casein, xylose, fructose, starch. So we, we created a profile to characterize how much power we can get from single microwave fluorescence, and this, this single is quite important, um, as you'll see later. But <clears throat> we, are, we are in a robotics laboratory, so part of our research is to develop a power supply for autonomous mobile artificial agents. So we wanted to look at the natural sources of those organic substrates, and we, we went to things like rotten fruits, um, grass clippings, prawn shells, and uh, dead flies, which I must emphasize had died of natural causes. And to, uh, <coughs> to clarify, so we um, we ended up building um, um, some robots on the left hand side of the movie that's currently playing. That's equal one, well, we call it a robot. It's a piece of styrene material with two wheels underneath, eight microwave fuel cells in, in there. And we wanted to demonstrate that we can get something running that does not have to be the size of a swimming pool. It can be small and it can be mobile. And we demonstrated that with Eco World One. As you can see, uh, by the way, those are not droppings of the robot. That was me marking the last position uh, to record the trajectory as it was following the line. <laughs> so the robot was basically follow tactic, it was following the light, and as you can see from the real time clock in the background, there's a jump every time it moves. So this is the pulsated motion behavior. This is something we can introduce into the technology, um, which basically um, shows uh, that we can we can harvest energy, just like Brad demonstrated with the waiting for the battery to charge. We are charging capacitors for the shorter term. So we're doing nothing in terms of the function of the system, uh, but when there's enough energy, the system has enough sophistication to wake up and go and execute the task. And what you see uh, playing on the right-hand side, that's equal to or Mr. Pinky, we ran on the blue styrene phone. Um, this was the, the robot which was using the open-to-air cathode, no longer chemical cathodes as we did for Ecobot 1, uh, and it was a robot that was running on flights. So we had the robot with eight flies, one per microbial fuel cell, and we asked it to follow the light. But because we were playing with mixed cultures of microbes, we showed uh, that we had more power. So instead of being simply for the tactic, we asked the robot to do something useful. So it had a temperature sensor, a microprocessor, and wireless transmitter. So every time it would wake up and move towards the light, it would sense, process, and transmit the temperature information to the base station that you see there for demonstration purposes. The base station was next to the robot for the real experiments we had about 30 meters away. Um, so in those, uh, we did some endurance experiments with ECOBOT 2, and we showed that on eight flies, it can run for about 12 days. This is a batch mode system, so a continuous flow system. So going back to the biofilm um, setup inside the microbial cell, microbial fuel cell, we didn't have the hydrodynamic flow to keep the thickness constant, and we didn't have the waste evacuation mechanisms. So the microbes effectively killed themselves from the acid waste build -up. That's why it came to a halt after 12 days. But um, it, uh, this robot ended up going into the Bristol Museum. Uh, I think. It was because it was the slowest robot in the world, not for any other reason, because in that 12-day period, it only covered a distance of two meters. <laughs> um, looking into the microbial fuel cell and how we can scale it up, there's again different schools of thought. 
how it can be done. Aaron showed earlier the miniaturization. It's a line we've been following for at least the last seven or eight years. And because we also think that scale up is actually the miniaturization. So miniaturizing the individual microbial fuel cell and then stacking it up in the hundreds, thousands, and more to get the power up. And we did some comparative experiments to prove that. So we started playing with uh, wastewater from uh, donated freely by a, a, a water utility company in Bristol, Wessex Water. And we also started playing with landfill leachate. But during that process, and we did all the analytical experiments to show the COD reductions inside our small microbial fuel cells, we developed ECO3, which is the wedding cake thing that you see going uh, left in the arena. With this robot, we demonstrated that we can have a higher number of smaller microbial fuel cells uh, and uh, have enough energy to have that robot maintain a circulatory system on board able to collect water and food from its environment, process the food through a header tank which is on the top, down to the microbial fuels to be digested, and then at the end of the day there's a peristaltic pump at the bottom of the conical header tank which basically pushes out a sensory pellet every day. So it's a pooing robot. It's not sustainable collecting fresh food from the environment, processing it, and then uh, crapping it into, the, into its little tray. Uh, I'm not gonna leave that running. You'll see the robot coming all the way back. Again, we've got the real time clock in the, in the background to see that it's, a, it's an intermittent process. It goes to sleep to generate the energy, and then it wakes up to, do, to perform the, the task. But you might be able to see before I, I move the, the cursor, you might be able to see the, the reflections of some stuff on the bottom. That's the stuff that the robot has excreted to its little tray. So we kept this robot go going for about eight days uh, before we had mechanical failure, pumps clogging up and, and things like that. So we're, we're now on to EcoBot 4, trying to solve those problems and uh, extend <coughs> the self-sustainability of the system. And it's only natural, we've been playing with uh, this microbial fuel technology for the last decade, it was only natural to start looking into human waste as the fuel. And this is part of the EPSRC Career Acceleration Fellowship. It was to show whether we can use urine directly in the microbial fuel cell process. And we, we've done that. Um, the bottom left graph shows the response time of the microbial cell when we have a constant biofilm onto the electrode, how rapid it is, and how directly proportional the dose response curve on the right to the minute amounts that we deliberately added to test the sensitivity of the system. The graph on the top shows the longer term, it's actually out of date, uh, it's a bit more than that, uh, but it shows that uh, periods of starvation, periods of not maintaining the microbial fuel cell, that would tend to indicate that the system is not producing, i.e. it died, actually show that it would recover to the same level when given fresh urine. So again, we went on and we started using it on our individual 25 milliliter microbial fuel cells, then EcoBot 6.25 milliliter microbial fuel cells, then building a stacks and testing how much urine can we utilize, how long it will take for the urine to be broken down, how much power we can generate. Notice that some of these graphs, they show density, but I just did for the comparative purposes. We stay clear away from uh, density. Uh, because we're empirical scientists, we're interested in what will actually work in the Newtonian sense. So we want to see how much absolute power we will get from our microwave fuel cells. Then we can do the projections and normalizations when it comes to electrons and volumes. And we tend to do that with the total amount of material that goes in and the total footprint that the system takes, which is um, perhaps slightly different to what other uh, colleagues are doing in the field. So as part of this uh, GC round seven call, um, we, we propose this project during Trinity and we have four main objectives. A, to show that we can produce useful levels of power from the uh, urine, to show the efficacy of the microbial fuel cell system to produce clean water, not, not just to treat the urine, but to produce clean water. Um, 
to, come to uh, show pathogen killing inside the microwave fuel cell development process, and then obviously <coughs> show the, the CO2 reduction um, in terms of the organic loading. And uh, we employed our smallest microwave fuel cell. Uh, Oliver, who's in the audience and co author, um, uh, uh, did this uh, work when he was in the lab uh, over the summer. Uh, and we basically set it up as a cascade. It's a stack cascade. So, still employing the stack multiplicity of units, but we have it as a cascade so that the effluent from the top goes into the bottom and so on and so forth. And we can control the height of the cascade so we can have n number of stages if we wanted more treatment. It's a one milliliter total volume, the microbial fuel cell. Um, so we, we showed that it power up we get is directly proportional to the position in the cascade, which is something we, we expected, but this is uh, quite useful to know uh, in terms of <coughs> setting up the system and doing the, the engineering and the electronics around it, but also in terms of virus and if we wanted to monitor each individual fuel cell and in order to dictate the number of stages we would need in the cascade. And albeit all connected fluidically, so we were kind of shorting out some of the pathways, we still wanted to connect it as a stack electrically. So we connected it all in series or in parallel, in different combinations of series and parallel. I'm just showing the best combination uh, that we did from those eight tiny microbial fuel cells. And we show that we have been producing the absolute uh, figures are quite uh, respectable in terms of the technology and the volumes that we've been playing with. And what you'll see here is the is a demonstration of the of the practical implementation to show what we can do. Again, we've got the in this case the supercapacitor. Uh, we've got it charged up by the eight microwave fuel cells. And we show this toy windmill as the exemplar of what we can do. Um, this is normally a much longer movie, but I've, I've cut it short to, to just show you that by connecting it, we can get the, the windmill uh, up and running. And then you'll see for how long it ran uh, with, a, with a timer next to it. So uh, to have something like that running, as you'll see by the end of this movie, for um, three plus minutes, it's very useful in terms of work generated from something that is flushed down the toilet, employing tiny amounts of uh, microwave fuels and volume and footprint. <coughs> so the second objective was to show that we can get <coughs> clean water production from the microwave fuel cell. Notice the highly scientific term in uh, quotes, pale. Um, we haven't done the analysis yet, but that's part of the project to do. The important thing is that we have been collecting those volumes of clean water from the cathode side of our microwave fuel cells. So this is it's the first time that something like this is, is reported to uh, to have a, an open to air cathode that produces enough water to perform the oxygen reduction reduction is one thing. To have one cathode that um, that actually produces excess water, which can be collected, uh, is quite another. And this is what we're showing here. We also did some tests against part of Oliver's uh, project to show the efficacy of the system to kill pathogens. Uh, we did it in a single microwave fuel cell in a stack of three. We still to do it in a stack of eight. Uh, and, and, and more, but what we're showing here is that uh, we used surrogate E. coli with a lactoluminescent uh, gene modification to see how it responds to the microwave fuel cell contingent against the controls, the A bio controls, and just running it through the microbial fuels so the process of extracting the energy out of the fuel showed that we have an almost three load for reduction in, uh, in the case of E. coli. <coughs> So just to summarize, um, we, we, by taking the urine and using it as a fuel, we can balance the NPK ratio, CNPK ratio inside the microbial fuel cell because it's a growing system, it's a living system. 
and more biomass will also consist of CMPK. So we're taking the imbalance CMPK from urine and we're balancing it through biomass formation on top of producing electricity. So this is looking into new biomass in this kind of early stage. It can be very, very useful for the wastewater treatment uh, industry. Um, preliminary findings from our ongoing work show that pathogens can be killed, that we can produce clean, and I say that with caution, water on the cathode, electricity generated from, from urine. And if we put the two together, this is our outlook for, for the future, wherever there is kind of urination, whether we have a hole in the ground, or a kitchen, <coughs> or a toilet, whatever it is, we can populate that with our stacks of microbial fuel cells that are running to generate the useful levels of electricity, or we can have a whole stack system underneath the ground to show that that's, the, that's a, a, a urine utilization um, system. So as we've got urine going through, we will be producing more electricity from the top levels, less electricity from the bottom, but on the other side, we will have uh, dirtier effluent from the top if we were to collect it from there, a cleaner effluent from the bottom. That movie was supposed to be uh, playing, unfortunately, I can play it once uh, I go through the acknowledgements from outside the presentation. Uh, just uh, want to thank you to our sponsors, the Engineering, Physical Science and Research Council, which is funding my uh, fellowship, the William Edna Gates Foundation, that's funding the work on, on urine, Wessex Water, our local water utility company, Framework Program 6 of the European Commission for the robotics work. Great Western Research and the Liberty Trust are funding some of the biodegradable work we're, we're doing. And <coughs> thank you for your attention. <coughs>